Okay, good evening and welcome everyone to tonight's call. Tonight we're gonna to be covering how to organize workplace, um, around workplace issues, mainly um, health and safety issues in the time of COVID-19. We're so incredibly excited to be here with you all. Um, and we're gonna be really breaking it down and doing a step-by-step -step, um, on how to, do, how to organize in this way in your workplace. We know that not a lot of people may be familiar with this type of organizing. It does carry a huge risk um, that we're gonna talk a lot about, but we think it's super important and obviously um, necessary. And so hopefully you're able to take um, some things from this call and apply it and bring it back to your coworkers, and I'm going to apply it in your own workplaces. So we're going to go ahead and get started. First and foremost, my name is Bianca Cunningham. I'm a staff organizer for Labor Notes. Labor Notes is an organization that's been around for a while. We've been around for 40 years. We do a few things. Number one, we do a monthly publication that covers uh, rank and file organizing or just workplace struggles in general from, from both non-union and unionized workplaces. It's very special because it's particularly through the lens of the workers themselves. We don't interview management, we don't interview CEOs, but we do trust workers and listen to them. The second thing we do is provide training for both non-union and unionized workers on how to build a campaign around an issue, uh, how to identify leaders, and also how to find the right issues that you want to fight about. And then the third thing we do is publish books. We have a book right now, Secrets of a Successful Organizer, that's become some sort of a Bible from organizers, not only in labor, but through community and a number of other ways, uh, or, like organizer ways to organize. People have found it very useful. It's a step-by-step -step breakdown on like how to do all of these things. And so really excited to be with you. Um, I come to the movement through my own labor organizing. And so I'm not just here as a person talking to you about this stuff, but I'm really about that life. Um, six years ago, I organized my own workplace, um, Verizon Wireless, a retail store. Uh, there were seven stores that me and my coworkers came together to uh, join the union um, communication workers of America. We were not union previous to that. We had no idea what we were getting ourselves into, but we, do, we did know that we wanted to come together to address a number of issues that were important to us. The issues ranged from sexual harassment, from management, or workplace bullying, or um, even stuff around wages and benefits. And so uh, we came together to form the union in that way. Um, the company fought us very hard, but we were able to overcome. And then we went on to bargain a contract uh, after a 49 day strike, we were finally able to secure a first contract. And to this day, Verizon Wireless retail stores in Brooklyn are unionized. So that's how I come to this work. I was actually fired for that organizing. And so when I say, I know that it's risky, I know that it's risky, but we're still gonna talk about it because we have to. Um, in my personal endeavors, I'm also a community organizer. I organize a lot around racial justice issues um, in New York City, I'm, I'm from Brooklyn. Uh, I organize in coalition with a number of organizations, but my main organization or my political home rather is the Democratic Socialists of America. And I also have uh, co-founded a space for black and brown radicals called the Afro-Socialists and Socialists of Color Caucus. So shout out to all the black and brown radicals around the country. We see you um, and we want to hear more from you. Um, and then I guess, yeah, so that's just me. We're going to get into it. Um, Right now in labor notes, I just want to say I facilitate a lot of trainings around the intersection of race and labor. So talking about how all of our struggles are connected. So my professional goal right now is to get us to really ask the deep questions or the follow up questions, which means that when a corporation says, for instance, Black Lives Matter, instead of us pointing to the CEO or the board of directors to look for diversity, we can then take it a step further and say, well, how are they treating their black and brown employees? The least of us, right? The what does your benefits package look like? We need to be asking those questions because that's the real way that they show us that Black Lives Matter. The way that they treat their essential workers is the real way that they show us that they think that essential workers are heroes. And so we can't take everything that corporations say for face value. We really have to do the deep digging um, and deep organizing with our own communities to um, address those issues. And so that's what I do professionally. Um, and so I just want to talk a little bit right now about the moment that we're in. The moment that we're in, we're in an 
and enrollment with COVID-19. Um, at Labor Notes, we work with a number of different types of workers. So everything from bus drivers to nurses to teachers, retail workers, and the list goes on and on. And so what we've been seeing lately is that, you know, New York's teachers in New York City are having to make a tough decision about what it looks like to reopen schools safely. Um, they've already got some confirmed cases. Um, and they're really struggling to see, like around the conditions of their, of their work environment. You know, the administration is saying a window that opens by two inches is sufficient ventilation um, for hundreds of students in a very old building. And so they're grappling for what it looks like for them to return to school safely. We see poultry plant workers all over the country, you know, in Wisconsin and North Carolina, et cetera, that were some of the most hardest hit workers of the COVID-19 pandemic. They had hundreds, if not thousands of cases nationwide. And these workers are black and brown workers, um, mostly from poor and working class communities. A lot of the, in a lot of time instances, they may be immigrant or undocumented workers. So the most vulnerable of all of the workers. And you see that they're struggling to fight for adequate PPE for safe working conditions. And their cries are largely falling on deaf ears. And so we see them struggling and, and trying to find a way. And then the sanitation workers in New Orleans as well. Um, shout out to the city waste union workers. They have been organizing around issues of COVID-19 since the very beginning. Uh, some of their demands included a $15 uh, wage. Right now they're making around $10 an hour as sanitation workers in New Orleans. Um, so they want $15. They want personal protective equipment from the employer. And they're also fighting around paid sick time, which is a lot of uh, workers around the country are, are fighting around those same exact issues. So shout out to the city waste union workers in New Orleans and all the workers all over the country trying to make the very impossible and tough decision of providing for their families and protecting their families from the virus. Um, we know that there are no easy answers, um, but it's, it's difficult and I think that we can work our way through it. So in the midst of all of that, I do wanna talk a little bit about some good news that's happening. So I think there is something that we can, that looks promising for us. In this moment, I feel like the fighting spirit the 30s and the 60s is like revisited us and this has really been a moment for workers to channel that fighting spirit and come together in collective action to address some of the issues that they've been seeing or the lack of um, you know adequate solutions from employers to keep in people safe and so I want to shout out the New Orleans public library workers because they have a really important organizing story the New York public library workers in the very beginning in March, when the pandemic kind of hit us all, started to think about the kind of communities they serve. And they said, well, we serve mostly black and brown and working class communities. Um, we want to keep them safe. And we see that in other places, they've been the ones that are hit hardest by this pandemic. And we also want to protect ourselves. And so they came together to try to see if they could shut down the local branches of the public library. And I wanted to share this particular instance because although they were already a part of a union, they didn't have any ties to their union. For instance, they didn't have a contact person for their union. And many of the workers, because Louisiana is a right to work state, were actually not members of the union themselves. And so I wanted to bring this up because I assume that most people who are listening are going to listen are also not union workers. There's only 6% of the population is unionized in the private sector. Um, and in public sector, it's not, it's 30%. And so that means that the majority of workers don't have a union. And so I think that their context is really important. So they organized completely outside of the regular union channels. They didn't have any of that infrastructure, infrastructure to rely on. But with how they started was that they circulated a petition internally between staff members to lay out kind of their case for why they felt like they wanted the branches of the library to close. So that means that there was a core group of them that were employed across a number of branches in New Orleans that came together to form an organizing committee. And that committee then wrote up a petition and all of the reasons they thought they should close. And then they started to circulate that with people that they knew and trusted. 
um, to get people to sign on. At the same time, they also did a petition on change.org for the public and for library patrons and community members who were also concerned about the library remaining open. And so they had two petitions going at the same time for a couple of days and it got the attention of the mayor and their management as well. The mayor and the management both um, chose not to respond to the petitions and so they took it a step further and a day later, they ended up doing what we call a sick out. What's a sick out? A sick out is whenever workers collectively call out sick or call in sick rather. Um, they use their paid sick time that they already have through the employer in order to um, you know, collectively choose not to work. It's not, it's different from a strike because they're using paid time, but they did do that. And within one day, um, because of the crisis um, and the short staffing that they were already dealing with, they were able to successfully shut down the branches of the public library and now have been shut down throughout this pandemic. And so they were able to see a victory um, rather quickly within a week and a half. And, and that is all based on infrastructure that they were able to build out rapidly. Some of the resources that they used for Slack, they used to Slack in order to keep in contact with people who are in different work, different branches of the library so that they can both process their emotions and all the uncertainty around what it meant to work during this pandemic and also strategize and be in contact with one another as they were making this demand and pushing it. They also really credit the local media with being able to help highlight their um, struggle and their demand. Um, and so we encourage all people, local media can sometimes be a, a great asset to use if you have access to that as well. And so they were able to win. And now, you know, talking to them, they're facing furloughs, like many city workers and many government workers are right now, but they've already got the infrastructure and the foundation in place to be able to fight back against that. So this is why what we're talking about tonight is so crucially important. It's not just about COVID-19, you can organize around a number of issues um, in your workplace and we'll get more into that later. So let's get into this call because I know that many of you, um, you know, are on this call to be able to learn, you know, these skills. And so I just wanna really quickly start with some legal context for COVID-19 organizing. So I'm just gonna go through some of the laws that protect us for the organizing. The first one is the National Labor Relations Act or the NLRA. And this is, gives protection for collective actions, including strikes directed at changing wages and working conditions. This is the highest protection. Um, you can strike over a number of things, but striking over abnormally dangerous conditions also applies um, in this instance. Then we have the Fair Labor Standards Act. And this is basically um, just the protection that you get to say that they have to pay a federal minimum hourly wage and also that they have to pay overtime. So if you or your coworkers have been working anything over 40 hours during the pandemic, you are entitled to time and a half. And that's what the Fair Labor Standards Act says. Um, the third thing is the Occupational Safety and Health Act or OSHA. Um, it says that you have the right to refuse dangerous work work, but it's important to note that OSHA is not enforcing this right now, um, but it's there. Uh, they also require employers to provide personal protective equipment, but then also outline that it's up to the employer to decide the type of equipment that's needed, how to provide it or, you know, to provide it, and then also to train employees on how it's used. And so it's a bit vague, um, but it is there for our own protection. And then more specifically for people who are in New York, like us, we have some laws. Um, so first of all, you have the right you know, of action for claims related to failure of failure to pay wages. If you feel like your employer is stealing wages from you, you can visit the National Labor Relations Board and an agent will take your testimony and, and investigate it. And that's for anybody, you can just walk in. Um, you also, there are also criminal fines and incarceration for wage violations, technically on the books, but we never really see these and I've never seen this. Um, it also says employer is forbidden from retaliating against employees for disclosing employer violations of laws or making complaints to government bodies. Um, and then it said there's an online form to file a COVID-19 workplace safety complaint with the New York State Department of Labor. 
I just want to say that I ran through that very briefly. I'm aware because I feel like the labor law was weak before COVID-19 and it continues to be weak now, especially with this current administration and the degradation of our National Labor Relations Board um, nationwide. And so we can't rely on the law to be the gotcha thing that that helps us um, win. It's just not going to be y'all. Like the company is going to break the law all the time and it's really going to be incumbent upon you and your coworkers to come together to take action and address it. Um, because if you are just relying on the law and the enforcement of the law, unfortunately I have to say, we're not gonna win that way. Um, so enough of that. Uh, <laughs> also, uh, if you have coworkers who are undocumented and or immigrant or migrant, you can watch our ICE Know Your Rights training at facebook.com slash Ocasio-Cortez videos. So now let's get into our pledge to organize. And we want everybody to put their hand on their heart because this is serious business. Um, if you're concerned or if you plan on talking to your coworkers about safety issues, please, please, please fill out this pledge form, y'all. We need your contact information so that we can get in touch. Uh, we'll connect you with a labor organizer to talk to who will provide one-on-one -on -one guidance, you know, as you begin talking to your coworkers and organizing around these issue issues. If you live in NY14, especially um, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's district, we'll also provide PPE for you to distribute at your workplace. And so please get in touch with us. It's bit.ly slash worker pledge. That's B-I-T dot L-Y slash work W-O-R-K-E-R-P-L-E-D-G. Bit.ly slash worker pledge. And again, if you're all concerned about safety at your job or thinking about talking to your coworkers about safety please, please, please fill out this form so that we can be in touch and get you the resources and the support that you need. Trust me, you're going to need it. So we're gonna talk about how to identify safety issues. So what kind of issues should we be fighting around? Um, at Labor Notes, we like to say that the issues should be widely felt, which means that they should be, be felt by a majority of your workplace or your coworkers. It should be deeply felt or connect to emotions it should be deeply felt. People should feel strongly enough about the issue that they're willing to take action around it. There's a difference between things that your coworkers complain about and that you're unhappy with um, and the things that you're actually ready to mobilize and take action around. You don't wanna find the small things that people may not like but not feel that strongly about. We wanna find the, the issue that people feel very strongly about and will take action around. Um, and then thirdly, and lastly, the issue can be small and every day. We say we want the issue to be winnable. Oftentimes people think you need to take on the boss about like this big issue that's like concerning wages or, you know, wage theft or, you know, even like unsafe, you know, any of those things. It doesn't matter. There's no category that's like wrong for what uh, issue be it just has to be winnable that's really important especially because this is high risk and so you want you don't want to ask for the moon right away you want to ask for things that people care about and that we say small enough to win but large enough to matter so those are the things that you should be thinking about when you're identifying safety um, issues so what can keep us safe during covid and I just want to go, These, there are different ways of controlling the transmission of the virus. And each way exposes us to a different level of risk. So we're going to start with the safest or, you know, um, the most protective and go down to the least protective. So elimination, what is elimination way? The best way to control a hazard is to eliminate it. If you can work from home, for example, you won't be exposed to sick customers or workers. So this is the ideal. The second is substitution. This means changing one way of doing work for another. Um, one example of this would be restaurants that normally allow people to dine inside, they become outside or delivery or takeout only. The third method is engineering. And these controls protect workers by removing hazards or using a barrier to keep the hazard away. Clear cough shields in front of a cashier and increased ventilation you know, or just a couple 
away so that there's more turnover of the air. These are all engineering controls. <clears throat> administrative controls is the next one, number four. Administrative controls, these are the procedures and trainings that change the way you do the work. So for instance, instead of swiping a customer's card yourself, you'll have them do it instead. Or staggering breaks are shifts, you know, so at the end times to reduce crowding or requiring customers to stand in line at designated uh, spots on the ground. These are all, um, you know, administrative controls. Uh, new procedures that will require training and a different way of doing things. And lastly, the least of um, what keeps us safe is personal protective equipment. Personal protective equipment protects only the user. So this is gloves um, and N95 respirators, often called masks. PPE is usually the least effective way to protect workers, but if a better solutions don't completely eliminate the hazards or while they're being installed, PPE may be essential. So that means that PPE is the absolute bare minimum your workplace should be providing in order to keep you and your coworkers safe. So the boss's plan or excuse me, what can keep us safe during COVID? So what keeps us safe? And these are some questions that we can ask both ourselves and our coworkers. And these are, we're gonna get into one-on-one -on -one conversations later on in the call and how to do them. But these are some questions that we should be thinking about as we're having these conversations with our coworkers. So what are some of the most important COVID-19 related hazards in your workplace? Identifying those first and foremost, and then talking about what do you all feel is the most effective way to eliminate or reduce the danger? And so your demand or your issue is gonna be formulated around these the answers to these questions between you and your coworkers. So the boss's plan versus our plan. We call it blame the worker versus fix the job. So what does the boss care about when it comes to health and safety and what do we care about? Are they the same things? So you see all these uh, dialogue going on about um, ec economics versus safety. Do we care about getting the economy started or do we care about saving lives, right? And this is the same kind of dynamic that's happening between workers and the boss. What does the boss care about? Do they care only about profit or are they actually trying to keep customers um, and workers safe? And what do you all care about? You know, I'm sure you care about job security, but I'm also sure you, you care about keeping yourself and your family safe from the virus as well. So having those conversations. Bosses want the worker. Their only way to reduce illness and injuries is by focusing on the behavior of workers. So if you get sick or injured, it must be your fault. And this is the way the boss oftentimes thinks about it. The workers, um, whether they're represented by a union or an informal work, uh, you know, organizing or health or safety committee, or whether, you know, you're brand new starting off, they want to fix the job itself. Uh, we want, you know, to identify and eliminate hazards or reduce existing hazards with engineering controls, like improving ventilation or safer procedures and move away, move people away from one another. Going back to the New York City teachers who are saying that a, two, a window opening by two inches is maybe not the proper ventilation, but they do want proper ventilation because they do want to reopen safely. And so these are the kinds of questions and the way that we um, you know, address these issues. So now we're gonna uh, hear from another amazing organizer, Royce Brown. He's from the Emergency Workplace Organizing Committee. Royce Brown is an organizer and training team member with the Emergency Workplace Organizing Committee, which is a joint effort between the United Electrical Workers and the Democratic Socialists of America to build a distributed grassroots organizing program for workers in response for COVID-19. He was born in Boston, Massachusetts, and he previously organized with the Writers Guild of America East and is a graduate of the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies. Welcome, Royce. Thanks, Bianca, as a uh, motorcycle guys, bye. Um, appreciate that intro. And uh, I'm gonna get uh, started with, let's say you've identified your weak, your uh, widely and deeply felt issues and you want to organize a workplace. So how do you start? You start with mapping. Uh, and mapping doesn't just mean the physical layout of your workplace, though that is useful to know. Uh, it really means social mapping and mapping people. Uh, so you're really going to create a list of everybody who works 
in your workplace. Um, and you are going to gather sort of basic but essential information, names, their role, their shift, uh, their phone number, a personal uh, non-work email because uh, companies can read uh, emails on their own servers. And um, you're going to track their, you know, what uh, their major concerns are, what issues they're concerned about. You're going to track uh, who you've assigned from your committee to talk to them. And uh, this is going to be kind of your roadmap for your entire campaign. So why do we do it this way? Well, it's important to build strength in numbers. That's basically how organizing wins is uh, through, uh, you know, a vast majority of the workers uniting around a single uh, cause. And you won't know uh, what that number is unless you have a list of everyone. And this will also allow you to track uh, the support for uh, the campaign as it goes. You know, are there areas that you are lagging behind in? Are there departments that are especially strong? Um, you know, these are patterns you can look for, and you'll also be able to keep people accountable for the assignments that you've given them. Um, you can download uh, this chart, which you'll see the second half of in the next slide at acasiocortez.com slash worker pledge. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so here we see on this uh, willing to get involved, that is what we would call assessment. So assessment uh, is essentially rating their current level of support. Uh, we usually use a one to five scale, one being uh, a, a working organizer leader or a committee member, uh, two being a supporter, three being undecided, uh, four being opposed, and five being actively opposed, actively working against you. Uh, this is frankly pretty rare. Um, and then someone who has not been assessed at all would be a zero. Uh, as I said, these assessments are not static. You will have to uh, update them as the campaign goes on. You know, people grow into leadership or people fall off. Uh, it's important to know where people are uh, as time passes. Uh, in terms of social mapping, you're also going to identify, you know, uh, how employees are grouped outside of their jobs. So, you know, are there cliques? Are there social uh, groups who hang out outside of work? Are there, you know, certain uh, language groups that are perhaps segregated from other workers? Uh, those things are important to know if you're going to talk to everyone. Um, this can help you, you know, figure out. Uh, who you need to talk to to really reach the most people. Now, the most important thing about the chart uh, is that it is incredibly important to keep it secure. So you should be very cognizant of who sees this chart. You should uh, make sure that only OC members or organizing committee members are gonna see it. And even then, uh, I would strongly discourage sharing it online um, and it should certainly never be accessed on any company property, you know, computers or phones. Uh, this is because if the boss gets a hold of this, that's essentially your campaign sunk. Um, you know, it would be like a football team showing their entire playbook to the other team. Um, next slide, please. So uh, you can access this uh, that chart along with other useful tools at uh, coffeecortez.com slash worker pledge, O-C-A-S-I-O-C-O-R-T-E-Z dot C-O-M slash W-O-R-K-E-R-P-L-E-D-G-E. -E. Next slide, please. So I was talking about uh, your organizing committee. So who's on that? Um, or I talked about worker leaders. That's who should really be on this committee. And why is that? It's because only really the workers can organize the workplace. As an uh, organizer, I can, you know, give advice or uh, support people in their efforts, but ultimately they have to build the, uh, the organization for themselves. And uh, leaders in this context are simply people who have followers, people who are respected in their workplaces, people who are well-liked or have seniority or are seen as experts in a certain respect. Are gone, are gone to when there's an emergency or a brought in to solve disputes. Uh, these are people who people will listen to, people with social sway, let's say. 
um, and the uh, to force the change to force change with your employer, these people are going to need to reach as many fuel stops as I've said, build a, build a super majority. We're talking 65 to 80 or more percent um, because one, you know, the more people who support the cause, the fewer, uh, the harder it is for the boss to ignore you. And people naturally, you know, come in and out of work, even in non, uh, even before COVID, you know, turnover can be high, especially in certain fields. Uh, people quit, people, you know, move or people get promoted. Um, but the number one thing you need are cohesive demands and a plan. But how do you assess these people? How do you tell who's really on your side? Uh, next slide, please. You do that through the organizing conversation. Now, this is like a very big topic, kind of the building block of organizing. And, you know, I could talk about this for an hour, but I will try to keep it brief. Um, the organizing conversation is uh, how your committee will assess the other people in your workplace. It takes the form of a one-on-one -on -one conversation um, which takes place outside of the workplace. Uh, and the reason for this is to create you know, a secure uh, and safe environment for them to share how they're feeling. And this is a intimate and personal relationship. You're building trust with this person by talking to them about their concerns. Uh, the other main thing I wanna emphasize is we, what we call the 80-20 rule, which is 80% uh, listening and 20% talking. You're really asking them questions and letting them uh, share how they're feeling. Um, so this structure that you see here is not like a hard and fast rule in terms of order, but these are all areas you want to hit, and this may take more than one conversation uh, if you're really going in depth with someone. Um, but to uh, to go through it, uh, introduction, you know, as you would in any conversation, uh, initiating, you know, just being personable. Hey, how's it going? How, how, you, how you been since you got back to work? Uh, you know, do you have a minute? And like, just making people feel uh, like you're not there to sell them something because you aren't, you're there to work with them. Now, the next one is getting issues. Um, this is probably where you'll spend most of the time and you're going to ask questions, very open-ended questions. You know, how are you feeling since we've come back into work? Uh, you know, do you feel safe here? very sort of broad stuff and let them uh, steer and guide where their uh, experience has been. And you're not going to, uh, even if you have like a specific issue that you know you want to organize around, you're not going to jump in with a, you know, we want to do this. Uh, can you sign this for us? You want to let them for themselves. And if they don't bring up that issue, you can talk about it later. Um, the next issue, the next step is to agitate. Agitate meaning not just making someone uh, mad, but getting them mad and energizing them, making them feel like they can do something about it. So, you know, you might ask, you don't, uh, you, you don't feel safe here. Do you think that's fair? Do you think that, you know, our boss has responsibility to look out for us? Uh, don't you feel like we're not being, uh, you know, compensated fairly? How do you feel about that? Um, and once you have somebody, you know, feeling ag agitated, you move on to educate and lay the blame, uh, which sometimes people roll into plan to win, but ultimately is talking in more detail about sort of the origin of these problems, you know, who specifically in management has uh, decision-making power, who's responsible for your situation, uh, who can you target to improve your situation, and, uh, you know, why, what was in this pre-existing problem before we got started or before COVID, you know, how are we going to maintain whatever we win now, later, um, essentially getting to think in a larger context about like what their, what their ideal looks like, what they would want to do and, you know, how they want to get there. Um, then you move on to the plan to win. So this, uh, this is where you can share what you've thought of so far, depending on where you're at. It might just be, we have a group of people uh, together that want to work on this issue. Do you want to come to a meeting with us? Or, um, you know, we have a with some demands on it. Do you want to take a look at it and maybe sign it? Um, 
this can really, this is really giving them like an outlet or like a jumping off point to continue working uh, on your goal. And then if they are on board for that, you want to move to inoculation. Inoculation, uh, which is certainly very timely, um, is in this case, uh, preparing the workers for how the boss will react if you uh, organize against them. So you want to be upfront, you want to be honest because you know you don't want to say there's no risk that we could always uh, lose our jobs anyway, but you don't want people to think like, oh, if we just do this together, we're invincible. You want them to think we're more likely to succeed if we work together. Um, at the same time, if someone's really afraid, you want to comfort them, you want to remind them of the you know, strength you have in as a group as opposed to individuals. Uh, but this is all about you know, keeping people uh, realistic about how this will work. And then if they still feel good about it, you want to get a commitment from them. You're giving them an assignment. Do you want to get me a shift schedule? Can you talk to two people? Can you give me their contact information? Uh, you're, just something to show that they are committed and uh, want to continue uh, in a real way with your campaign. And you want to set a consistent follow-up. So you say, you want to give them a deadline. Today is Wednesday. Can you talk to those two people by Friday? And can we meet then? Uh, this builds, you know, a sense of urgency and helps them, uh, you know, helps test how committed someone really is. Next slide, please. So, I know that was a lot of information to get at once. But if you go to ocasiocortez.com slash worker pledge, O-C-A-S-I-O-C-O-R-T-E-Z.com slash W-O-R-K-E-R-P-L-E-D-G-E, -E -E -E, uh, you will find in the chat, along with the charting forms, you'll find a guide to the ranking conversation and some exercises. And honestly, I would just strongly suggest practicing as the best way to get better at this. Um, and now uh, it is my turn to introduce our next speaker, Gabriel Morales, uh, born and raised in San Antonio, Texas. Gabriel is the program director at Brand Workers, an organization of New York City food factory workers organizing for dignified jobs and a just food system by building a union with the industrial workers of the world, the IWW. He believes in the power of solidarity, direct action, and worker-led organizing. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and thank you, especially to Bianca and to Royce for kind of framing up this uh, discussion for us. What we're talking about is really what we're talking about is like, what are the tools that you need to build a strong representative worker committee in your workplace? And so now that you have those tools, now that we've talked through like, what are the steps that you need to take to achieve that? Now we're gonna be able to talk to talk about what you have to do to overcome employer opposition. So really quickly, uh, let's review what was previously said about issues. Um, so as Bianca mentioned, issues are widely felt and they're deeply felt. Issues connect to visceral, visceral persistent emotion. These issues, they don't have to be cataclysmic. They can be small and they can be everyday. And maybe the most important thing is that these issues, they need to be winnable. So when IDing winnable issues in your workplace, look for the intersection of your employer's maximum vulnerability and the moves that your campaign can make to make your workplace safer and more humane. So finding and winning on these issues requires two things, it's two pretty simple things. Uh, but they're even more important in these emergency times. Uh, one is a strategy and one is a plan. And here's the PowerPoint to show you that. Uh, so again, that's how we're going to systematically win the smallest and the biggest issues in our workplaces, whether it's more privacy in the employee dressing room, whether it's more stability in our scheduling from week to week, uh, getting higher wages to pay the rent, to feed our families. We need to have a strategy and we need a plan. So this is about looking at our campaigns and the strength that we built 
and like trying to figure out how can we take the issues that we have identified and win those issues. And so you'd really be surprised to learn, like in my work in Brand Workers, I'm sure that Bianca has encountered the same and Royce has encountered the same. You'd be surprised to learn like how many organizing campaigns, they just don't take the time to do this work. They don't take the time to figure out how to, what is the strategy? What is the plan? But having strategic clarity makes the campaign more understandable to your coworkers. And it makes your work ultimately much more credible. So let's talk about how to, how to do that then. Uh, so let's start with strategy, like issue-based strategy. What, we'll talk about what it is. We'll talk about what it isn't. Uh, so what is strategy? Strategy is a deliberate, a deliberate, explicit set of choices. The choice is to engage in some defined group of activities to the exclusion of some other group of activities. It's pretty simple. So strategy isn't, it isn't an all-encompassing list of all the things that you and your coworkers possibly do in the universe. It isn't just best practices, uh, which is something that we talk a lot about in the nonprofit world, in the labor movement world, best practices. It's not just best practices. It isn't even just your group's vision statement. It's not even just a plan. Strategy is about making choices to win. It's about ch making choices about what to do. And just as importantly, it's about making choices about what not to do. So to make a strategy to win on workplace issues, you have to answer three questions. And the three questions are, uh, what's our winning aspiration? That's question number one. What's our winning aspiration? Number two, where will we focus? And then number three, how are we gonna win? So I'm gonna go over each of those questions in depth. We'll get, we'll get into them, we'll get into them. Uh, but, you can come up with the answers to the strategy questions by beginning the research of your company and, it, and the industry that you're working in. You, and you start with your firsthand knowledge as workers. It's really helpful to blank page brainstorm these questions with coworkers and with your campaign advisors, if you have them. And if you don't, reach out to some. And, We'll be happy to help you. We'll talk about that more a little bit later in the, in the webinar, uh, people that you can reach out to. And another thing you can do is assess other strategy choices made by other campaigns for inspiration. It's really helpful to draw inspiration from both contemporary and historical organizing examples. Two examples that really inspire us at Brand Workers, uh, one contemporary one is the work that some fellow workers in the North West, I always get East and West mixed up, but fellow workers in the Northwest are doing at a fast food uh, company called uh, Burgerville. And they're doing amazing work over there, trying to organize themselves as fast food workers. Um, Bianca brought up some important examples that you might want to check into as well, like the workers that are doing important work in New Orleans and all over a place all over the country. There's, there's really inspiring contemporary work happening right now. Workers are organizing and winning. But then look to historic examples as well. Like our, you know, the people that came before us have a lot to teach us. And so one historic example that we're inspired by is dock worker organizing in the 1910s in Philadelphia. They organized with the IWW in uh, a local called Local 8. They did some amazing work that people should know more about and talk more about. And so, uh, so, that, so look at that. So all of that was just like, how are you gonna answer these questions? So let's get back to what we were talking about earlier. Let's get back to it. What is our winning aspiration? Like, what are we doing as workers when we're organizing? What, well, your winning aspiration is another way to think about your long-term goals. It answers the question, what is the purpose of your organizing? Why does it exist? Another way to think about it is, what is the one thing about your workplace, just one, if you could take one thing, what is the one thing about your workplace that will be different if you achieve all of your goals? That's what your winning aspiration is. A good example of a winning aspiration in my mind is my coworkers and I will be united 
and have a say in the decision-making process of this workplace. That's a good winning aspiration. Again, your winning aspiration is that one thing that will be different in your workplace as a result of your organizing. Remember that right now, right now, bosses have vulnerabilities that are arguably unprecedented, at least in our lifetimes. This is a watershed moment, as both Royce and Bianca mentioned. This is a watershed moment for worker organizing. So don't find yourself limited by our understanding of what, what workers with unions have done over the past 20 years. Much of what we thought was possible, or impossible rather, much of what we thought was impossible uh, in this moment, in, during COVID, during the pandemic, has proven to be possible as a result of the courage, the determination, and the strength of, wor of workers coming together across the globe. So just take a moment to think big about what you and your coworkers deserve in your workplaces and what that workplace will look like when you have that. And so that's your winning aspiration. Answer that question first, do that first. And your winning aspiration should, should be supported by a broader set of goals. So decide on those goals, write them down. Your, these are your goals on your way to your winning aspiration. You can have short-term goals. Like a good example might be we want to ensure that the company's fire extinguishers are fully maintained and accessible, that they're in a visible location. That's a good short-term goal. A good long-term goal, well, your ultimate long-term goal is your winning aspiration. But other potential long-term goals could be, for example, access to affordable health, a viable path to retirement, across the board pay, pay raises for you and your coworkers, and it's up to you to decide what your winning aspiration is and, and what the goals are along the way. But if you don't write the goals down, if you don't write them down, the vast majority of the time, you're just not gonna get there. And so this, this uh, PowerPoint, I don't know which way I'm pointing, this way or that way, but you see on the, on the, the, that goals, the best goals are smart goals. They're specific, they're measurable, they're achievable, they're relevant to the mission, and they're time bound. Okay, so that's the first. Please, if I'm taking too long, please give me a little note because I'll just keep going. Like, so that's that's the first question. Remember, we're answering three questions. What's our winning aspiration? Where are we going to focus? How are we going to win? So the second question, where will we focus our struggle? Another way to answer to ask that question is where should we focus our energy? to achieve our winning aspiration. So for many in the labor movement and for those of us in this training, the first answer is obviously the shop floor. Uh, but in particular moments and for particular issues we want to have addressed, it might be important to have your organizing committee focus on a very specific shop floor issue. Worker safety, paid time off, an abusive manager. There might be even a, uh, moments where it's important focus the struggle in our community, in the media, at City Hall, at the state capitol. You know, often the labor movement has chosen places other than the shop floor to focus its struggle. Uh, there's places that you could choose the boardroom, the courtroom, the labor board, the court of public opinion, the ballot box. There's not necessarily a right answer that we could tell you right now. But this training is giving you the tools that you need to build a strong organizing committee to think through what you need and decide how to get there. So the last question, I'm gonna start going a little bit faster because uh, I know that we're, we're kind of running up on time. So now that you've thought through your winning aspiration and your area of focus struggle, you need to decide how you're gonna win in that chosen area of struggle. So again, there's many valid answers to this question. Uh, but remember that it's this choice is not about how we're going to win in general. It's about how we're going to win in this very specific space that we've chosen. Uh, one tried and true answer to this question, especially in the early parts of the campaign that Royce went over, is the answer to this question, how are we going to win, is we're going to identify the most respected workers on the shop floor, and we're going to come up with thoughtful, individualized plans to bring them into the organizing campaign. 
later in the campaign, it might be something different. Like the way that we're going to win is like turn 10 people out to confront a shop, uh, to confront an abusive manager on the shop floor. Turn 100 workers out and community members to a demonstration in front of the workplace. Answering how you win could look more like public shaming of the company by exposing the hypocrisy of the company. Um, but to sum that all up, like when you have the answers to these questions, you have the foundation of a solid strategy to help you win your demand. And so practice those answers, practice explaining it simply and quickly so that you can convey that strategy to your coworkers. Now that you have a strategy though, how are you gonna make that strategy into reality? You have to have a plan, an execution plan. And so you need to think through a couple of questions. What are we gonna need in order to win? And what are the support structures that are gonna be required? A bad plan is better than no plan. And that's what we've learned from our experience. You can change a bad plan, but it's very difficult to change a plan that's not, that doesn't exist or that's not written down. And so make a plan to achieve short-term and long-term goals by working back, backwards from your goals. What do you wanna change? Who has the power to change those things? What are the tactics that you need as defined by your strategy? And so document who's gonna do what and by when they're gonna do it, but your plan is your roadmap. It's got key goals, it's got milestones that show you the path and with your team mem and it's got team members that are accountable with deadlines to make sure that those things get accomplished. And uh, next slide, please. So we wanted to talk really quickly about mutual aid uh, because now that we have strategy and planning to covered, mutual aid is a specific method of organizing that's been being talked a lot about lately for good reason. Like a lot of people are doing it right now and it's a really exciting time for organizers that are focused on mutual aid. So what is mutual aid? Mutual aid is meeting each other's needs through organizing, through solidarity and not through charity. Through mutual aid, we recognize that our well-being, our health and our dignity are all bound up in each other. It means that we understand our survival depends not on, cooper on cooperation, not on competition on cooperation and not on competition. And so in this particular moment, we see that our health is also dependent on other people's health. We can literally save each other's lives right now. And so rather than disengage and feel powerless, mutual aid allows us to plug in where we can make the most impact locally in our workplaces and in our communities. So talk through examples of mutual aid in your group that your group can engage in including fundraising for coworkers that are sick, sharing PPE supplies, putting together a strike fund. Make sure that when you are doing things like fundraising that, that you and your team have clear written democratic systems for how funds, for example, could be allocated among those directly impacted. Make sure that when you raise strike funds or you know, mutual aid funds that you're abundantly clear on the limitations and the priorities of those funds. As many profound financial needs will surface, surface especially among low income immigrant workers who in this time, they're just up, being uprooted from their employment. And um, that's mutual aid. And so uh, let's talk really quickly about next steps. Uh, we want you to go to ocasiocortez.com slash worker pledge to download our toolkit. It includes the map template we went over. It includes an agenda for the organizing conversation that Royce went over. Uh, it, includes, it includes other resources that we didn't even get to cover today. Uh, and so again, that link, it's right there, ocasiocortez.com slash worker pledge. Ocasio-Cortez.com slash worker pledge. I'm going to spell it out. O-C-A-S-I-O-C-O-R-T-E-Z dot C-O-M slash W-O-R-K-E-R-P-L-E-D-G-E. Ocasio-Cortez.com slash worker pledge. I hope that I didn't mess up those letters. But sign this pledge. 
if you plan on talking to your coworkers about safety issues, please fill out this pledge form. Again, put your hand over your heart and uh, fill out and sign this pledge form. Uh, we need your contact information so we can get in touch. We're gonna connect you with a labor organizer who's gonna be able to provide you that one-on-one -on -one guidance that you're gonna need as you begin to talk to your coworkers and organize. If specifically, if you live in NY14, uh, which is Congresswoman uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's district, uh, we will also be able to provide PPE for you to distribute at your workplace. Go to bit.ly slash worker pledge and take that pledge. Uh, B-I-T dot L-Y slash W-O-R-K-E-R-P-L-E-D-G-E. -E -E. That's right. <laughs> That's it, I think. Uh, again, if you're at all concerned about safety at your job or thinking about talking to your coworkers about safety, please fill this out so we can reach out and support you. Um, and the next slide, we have organizations that you can connect to. Uh, of course, we have the wonderful organizers at Labor Notes, uh, Bianca, just a shining light for our movement. Thank you so much for your work at Labor Notes and everything else that you do. Um, the incredible work being done right now uh, all over the country, really, uh, with EWOC, the Emergency Workplace Organizing Committee. Uh, we, have, we have links there. And of course, you can find out about all the work that we're doing here in New York City. Uh, across the five boroughs, organizing mostly artisanal bread uh, workers in local food manufacturing uh, at brandworkers.org. And uh, so there's our uh, websites and our Twitter handles. That is the end of our webinar. I just want to make sure that, uh, you know, we'll thank everyone for sticking around and coming on the webinar. Thank you to all the speakers. Uh, thank you to Bianca, to, to Royce, to the incredible team with Team AOC for supporting and doing all the tech work and, you know, helping with the translation and making sure that we, we this thing got uh, off the ground and ran as smoothly as it did. And I especially thank all of you all for tuning in and have a wonderful night. And that's it. Bye.